Now, normally we don't release episodes on this channel on Tuesday. However, yesterday we started off our new series on New Orleans with the Casket Girls and the possibility that through the French royal family and the Catholic Church, vampires were brought to the new French colony of Louisiana in the New World. Well, today we're going to talk about the two most feared vampires still in New Orleans to this day. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of my patrons and my producers on this channel. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box Hello. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we're going to be talking about the Carter Brothers. New Orleans has many nicknames. One is the Big Easy, which we're going to cover later on in our story, and another is the City of the Dead. New Orleans is called the City of the Dead because of their cemeteries. As we all know, New Orleans is a city that's almost in a bowl. In fact, in certain places of New Orleans, if you look out onto the Mississippi River, you can actually see that you are below sea level. Because of this situation with being below sea level, a lot of the cemeteries are built like vaults. Knowing that New Orleans is a city that's susceptible to tropical storms and hurricanes, it was necessary to inter bodies a little bit differently than burying them in grave plots. This is because within a tropical storm, these bodies could have been pulled up from the ground and literally tossed around the city. One of the ways that people are buried in New Orleans is called an oven vault. If you tour a lot of the cemeteries, you will see these like mausoleum type structures within the cemeteries or along the walls in the cemeteries with each structure being dedicated to a particular family. Sounds normal, right? Well, here's the catch. Each of these vaults can carry multiple generations of the same family. How does this work? Well, this works in about two phases. When a loved one passes away, the family will place that person into the vault, the family vault. This is phase one. Because of the heat and the humidity of New Orleans, the vault then acts like an oven, causing the body to decompose a lot faster than it would out in the elements. By the time another family member passes away and they go to open up the vault, Phase two begins for the original body that was in the vault. When they open the vault again, what remains of the person that was there before is typically just bones. And so they'll take the bones and push it back into the family vault to then put the next person in for their phase one. Even though this seems horrific to be able to see your family's bones after they've been in that vault for a while, this does seem to be a very economic way to bury people. Well, in the 1930s, two boys, John and Wayne Carter, were tried and convicted for being in New Orleans. Of course, because of their crimes, they were. However, when they went to open up the Carter family vault to start the phase two for John and Wayne Carter, their bodies were gone. Now, to be fair, before they were arrested, they did tell the police officers that they were vampires. But we all know there's a very specific method to take out a vampire, and a typical human is not one of them. In the beginning of the 1900s, all through the roaring 20s, New Orleans was a booming place. 
The port in New Orleans, Louisiana was the busiest in the whole country. And because of this, the city and the citizens experienced economic prosperity. Because of this economic prosperity, jobs were very, very easy to come by. This is where New Orleans got the nickname, The Big Easy. At this point, all the citizens had disposable income. And they say that idle time is the devil's playground. Well, that, and of course, a disposable income. The nightlife started to boom in New Orleans and this new form of music called jazz became all the rage. Many people from all over America and the world started immigrating to New Orleans to get a piece of that big easy pie and that quite fun lifestyle. However, as we all know, once we entered into the 1930s, we had an economic crash called the Great Depression. No one was safe from the Great Depression. And virtually overnight, all the citizens of New Orleans felt the impact of the stock market crash. Jobs that were easy to come by all of a sudden weren't so easy anymore. Well, John and Wayne Carter were two young brothers who worked down at the docks on the river. They had a third story apartment in the French Quarter of New Orleans. By this point, they were feeling the effects of the Great Depression and did whatever manual labor they could find in order to make money. But in 1932, John and Wayne Carter's lives would drastically change when an 11-year-old little girl was spotted frantically running down Royal Street in New Orleans. Eventually, the police were able to intercept with this young child. She told the police a wild story. She said that she and a few other people had been taken by the Carter brothers. She said that once they were taken, the Carter brothers tied them up in their apartment and used her and these other people as a source of food. She claimed that the Carter brothers would make little slits in their wrist. And by these slits, they would squeeze into a cup in order for them to drink. She said the Carter brothers would leave before the sun came up and would always come back home right after the sun had set, sometimes with new victims. Well, at first, the police did not believe this little child. They thought this was a child with a wild imagination and she was just telling stories. But they wanted to double check, so they followed the little girl back to the apartment from whence she had come. This apartment was at the corner of Royal and St. Anne. Once they got inside the apartment, they were horrified by what they found. Four other people were tied up in that apartment, clinging to life. They, too, had bandages wrapped around their wrist, bloodied by the constant use of cutting open their wounds every single night, just as the little girl had stated. But there was something else in the apartment. There was a very distinct smell. The police knew right away that this was the smell of death. And in the adjoining room, there were two lifeless bodies wrapped up in a blanket in storage. Now the police decided that since John and Wayne Carter were not home, they would first get the victims out of the apartment, but then they would just wait and do a sting operation for when they came home later that night. So the police set up their stakeout right outside of the Carter's building. And sure enough, later that night, they spotted the Carter brothers walking back home to their apartment. The police jumped out to arrest them, and at first the Carter brothers ran up into their apartment and up on the roof. To try to escape arrest, they jumped three stories, landing perfectly fine on the ground. It then took an additional eight officers to pin down the brothers. These brothers had superhuman strength. Once the brothers were in handcuffs, they admitted to the police officers that they were vampires, and they begged for the police officers to put them out of their misery. As long as they were undead, 
they would continue to have to feed off the life force of living human beings. They knew that if they were put into the court system, the court system would not do the proper job because, again, these two brothers were not bound to the same laws of nature that a living human being is, meaning that if they were executed by the state, it wouldn't actually they were some beast living a hellish nightmare between the living and the dead. And they knew what the cops needed to do to remove them from their life sentence of being vampires. Well, of course, the cops, being logical men, arrested them and sent them into the court system, where, as I said earlier, they were tried as and not vampires. So the thing that the Carter brothers feared the most happened. And after it appeared that they had been punished for their crimes by the court, they were placed into the Carter vault. But as I said earlier, once the vault was opened back up again for the bodies of the boys to enter into phase two, they were both gone. Of course they were. They weren't totally dead to begin with. Now, legend states that for one to become a vampire, a vampire has to feed on that person for seven days in a row. And we know from multiple stories that vampires pick people. Some people are simply their dinner, while others end up becoming their confidant in the world of the undead. And whether the Carter brothers meant to or not, it appears that one of their victims ended up becoming a vampire himself. Because this victim would go on to about 32 other people by drinking their blood. People say to this day that you can still see the Carter brothers hanging out in the French Quarter. So if you happen to be in New Orleans in the French Quarter one night and two brothers come up to you named John and Wayne, don't leave with them. And make sure you're surrounded by your own friends so they don't have the power to overtake you and bring you back to their new lair where you then will become their food source. All right, guys, I hope that you enjoyed that story. That was just a real quick one that I thought was kind of fun to tell. Interestingly enough, I couldn't find a whole lot of legitimacy behind this story. I couldn't find any pictures or witness testimonies or anything like this. So there is a possibility that this story might just be folklore and not a legitimate story, like the casket girl story was pretty legitimate. But if you are from New Orleans or if you've experienced the Carter brothers in New Orleans, I would love for you to let me know down in the comment section below. All right, guys, tomorrow we will be covering part three in the apocalypse of Abraham. Again, we did take a break last week because David Zublick was on vacation, so I'm super excited to get back into Abraham's story. Thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the full opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. Again, thank you so much to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you all today. And I thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.